Hello, everyone. First, let me thank the Dysphagia Research Society organizing community for acting quickly and sensibly to the current situation. And I hope that everyone listening is safe and in good spirits. I would like to acknowledge our funding source, Alberta Cancer Foundation, the IRS MSLPs who helped us with recruitment, and our patients and their families, of course. Dr. Jenna Rieger and I are listed inventors on a patent for the mobile swallowing therapy device used in the study. Um, Dr. Rieger is also the CEO and I'm the CPO of a startup called True Angle Medical Technologies, our first product being the mobile health system used in this study. Dysphagia, as you know, can be managed in a number of ways, one of them being rehabilitative exercises. Particularly relevant to these exercises is the idea of overloading the system to essentially obtain adaptation. We also know that the use of biofeedback as an adjunct to swallowing rehab exercises can help by increasing awareness to what those muscles are actually doing and by assisting patients to meet clinical targets. We don't know what the right program to recommend is, and because the majority of these exercises are completed as home programs, we don't know what patients are in fact doing at home. Therefore, to be able to eventually answer these questions as a field, adherence to home-based programs must be understood. Adherence, however, is difficult to reliably measure. So far, we use different operational definitions as a field, and we rely heavily on clinician and patient report. Mobile health technologies here offer an opportunity to reliably capture adherence to home-based therapies. So the primary aim of this study was to report on weekly objective adherence to home-based swallowing therapy in head and neck cancer patients using a mobile health swallowing system. And the secondary aim was to determine which patient factors, if any, are related to adherence. Because the primary aim of the study was to understand adherence to home-based swallowing rehabilitation, we used consecutive recruitment and recruited anyone who had oropharyngeal dysphagia secondary to head and neck cancer treatment, and referrals came from tertiary centers, and a few patients also self-referred. A priori inclusion exclusion criteria were set, so participants were included if they had dysphagia, obviously, secondary to head and neck cancer treatment, and if their pretreatment MBS assessment indicated that they may benefit from the effortful and the Mendelssohn maneuver swallows. They were excluded if they were not at least three months post-cancer therapy and if they had a history of recurrence or acquired brain injury. So we excluded five participants for the reasons listed above, one participant per reason, and 20 participants were enrolled in the therapy program. The two analyses run were an intention to treat analysis and a per protocol analysis. The mobile health system used is called Mobility and it consists of a wireless device that you see that uses surface electromyography to capture what the activity of the submental muscles is. The system also comes with an app that shows patients that biofeedback as well as some other targets I won't get into. And the system also comes with a remote clinical monitoring portal. And one of the portal features used for this study was the uh, obtaining the number of exercises attempted out of those prescribed. An appointment was booked to determine eligibility of patients for the program through an MBS. And eligible patient participants were taught the exercises and the use of the mobile health system. The treatment program started the day they first used the app and ended six weeks later. And the app also walked patients through the same sequence um, of sets of exercises that resulted in a daily target of 24 regular, 24 effortful, and 24 Mendelssohn um, maneuver swallowing exercises, or 72 trials. All were recommended as saliva swallows. A weekly check-in with a speech-language pathologist was completed to answer questions and to demonstrate competence or knowledge of the exercise practiced. 
Daily adherence was calculated as a percentage of trials completed from trials prescribed. From here, we obtained an average weekly adherence for a total of six data points per participant. And to determine average weekly adherence for the group, we ran a linear mixed effects model with repeated measures analysis. To determine if any factors were predictive of adherence, a univariate association analysis was conducted using the following, following variables. So our participants, the average age was 62 years with the youngest participant being 35 and the oldest being 72. Three quarters of them were male. The majority of participants had a primary site in the oropharynx of various T stages. Almost all participants had surgery. Most participants received surgery first, followed by adjuvant treatment, with almost half of participants having received surgery followed by CRT. And time since treatment ranged from half a year to over 15 and a half years. And because these data were skewed, we decided to divide them up into three categories that you see here, um, less than two years, two to five years, and over five years from cancer treatment. ITT analysis, intention to treat, the one where all data points were included, um, shows that adherence remained high from 84% in week one to 72% in week six. Per protocol analysis, three data points or weekly averages were excluded across three participants, and adherence at week six was 77%. If we excluded two participants with sensitivity analysis with extensive medical difficulties, week six adherence was 79%. If we excluded two other participants with technical difficulties, week, week six adherence was 74%. And if we excluded participants with both medical and technical difficulties, so four participants overall, adherence at week six was 85%. This was the one analysis where, as a group, weekly average adherence remained above 80% in all six weeks. The univariate association analysis revealed that only these four factors were predictive of adherence. Patients who received radiation therapy were 15.3% less adherent at week six than those who weren't. Um, patients experiencing medical difficulties had 36.4 lower adherence than those who did not at week 6. Those experiencing technical difficulties had 28.7% worse adherence. And compared to patients within two years of their treatment, so using that as the reference point, patients who were two to five years out had a higher adherence of 21.7% at week six, and patients who were over five years out had an adherence score that was 19.8 higher at week six. So adherence rates um, suggest that treatment that is home-based and uses mobile health um, is well accepted by participants in this study. And because of the variability in the way adherence has been operationalized across studies, it is difficult to make a true comparison between our findings and those of others, unfortunately. Um, all we can really say is that our adherence rate uh, rates as defined, um, as defined as number of trials completed over those prescribed were uh, high. The presence of radiation therapy was associated with a negative impact on adherence, while time since cancer treatment was associated with a positive impact. And here it's possible that xerostomia, pain, perception of dysphagia severity, a number of competing follow-up appointments, all of these may explain these observations. Now this was a feasibility study, hence findings would need to be rec replicated with a larger sample and in the absence of clinician remote monitoring or weekly check-ins. Um, we had selection bias, of course, and next it'll be important to continue to investigate factors that could be leveraged to promote adherence or used to know which patient groups require extra focus. And finally, mobile health technologies do offer an opportunity for us to understand the impact of treatment dose on swallowing function. <laughs>